Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the third in this series of uh, short seminars on the subject of uh, the relief of uh, 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 shareholders from unfairly prejudicial conduct of the company in which they are invested. Once again, I have uh, muted the sound and I have turned everyone's camera off so as to preserve bandwidth. Um, following last week's lecture, I received again some kind comments. Um, uh, 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 they are gratefully received. These seminars do involve uh, considerable preparation and uh, I am very glad indeed that they are seemingly uh, uh, well received. I have, as uh, I had in previous uh, seminars, prepared some slides to accompany them and I'll share them now with you using the screen share function. You should now have in front of you the cover slide to uh, this uh, presentation. In the first of these seminars, I introduced you to the jurisdiction and we examined some of the procedural and practical uh, 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 regulations applying to applications under Section 994 of the Companies Act. Last week, I turned to look at uh, uh, some of the requirements and in particular the requirements of unfairness and prejudice that needs to be satisfied in order to invoke the jurisdiction under section 994. This week I am going to be examining the uh, some examples of unfairly prejudicial conduct that are frequently encountered in practice. At the outset I think it's important to stress that the uh, uh, categories of unfairly uh, prejudicial conduct are in no way closed. Unfairly prejudicial conduct can take very many different forms. The courts are constantly uh, being required to consider novel circumstances alleged to involve unfairly prejudicial conduct and are regularly uh, uh, identifying previously unseen examples of unfairly prejudicial conduct. I'm certainly not going to attempt to uh, describe every example of unfairly prejudicial conduct that's been considered by the courts. Rather, I'm just going to address the most common examples of unfairly prejudicial conduct that are encountered in practice. First, I want to start with uh, what I describe as the exclusion from participation cases. This is certainly one of the most common forms of unfairly prejudicial conduct that one comes across uh, uh, in this area. Exclusion from participation can take a number of different forms. Of course, it can take the form of an exclusion following the removal of the petitioner from his office as a director of the company. But as I emphasised last week, uh, the petitioner does not need to hold a directorship of the company. And so, of course, um, uh, uh, an exclusion from participation may also take the form of his removal from a senior management position within the company. It's not even the case that the exclusion cases necessarily involve a removal of the petitioner from a position within the company. Uh, very often these cases are uh, uh, demonstrated at a more pragmatic or practical level. So, for example, uh, a failure on the part of persons in control of a company to hold uh, the meetings required of a company uh, might involve unfairly prejudicial conduct in the form of exclusion of the petitioner from his participation in the uh, conduct of the affairs of that company. Uh, even if meetings are held, the exclusion may still take uh, place in the form of a failure to permit the petitioner from uh, involving himself in the participation of those meetings. And even if he is permitted to attend the meetings, the exclusion may take the form of a failure to give proper consideration to the views expressed by the petitioner at those meetings. In relation to the uh, exclusion from participation cases, I think it's important to remember that there is no general right on the part of a shareholder to participate in the conduct of a company's business and affairs. In other words, the recognition of a right to participation is the exception rather than the rule. 
in the absence of an agreement between the participators in a company that they should have a right to uh, involvement in the conduct of the business and affairs of the company, or in the absence of what might be categorised as a quasi-partnership, where, where one incidence of that relationship is a right to participate, um, recognised in equity. In the absence of either of those situations, then uh, no right to participation in the management and conduct of the affairs of the company arises. In the case of widely owned companies, for example, those listed on public stock exchanges, it's highly unlikely, therefore, that any right of participation uh, will be found to exist. And likewise, uh, if the articles of association or a written shareholders agreement regulating the relationship between the participa participators in a company specifically denies any such right of participation, then that agreement is likely, in fact, almost certainly to be determinative of the position and no right of participation will arise. I also want to stress that the, uh, 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 whilst the right of participation in the conduct of the business and affairs of, an, of a company are regularly recognised, particularly in relation to closed, uh, closely controlled companies or uh, corporate successors to partnerships or indeed family companies, for example, whilst those rights to participation are widely recognised in such situations, the right to uh, participation through employment with the company is much less common. Uh, rights to uh, uh, continued participation do occasion, uh, in the form of uh, employment, do occasionally uh, uh, receive recognition in the courts. But generally, the agreements between participants do not extend to include agreement that the participants uh, should be entitled to continued employment by the company uh, for so long as they hold their shareholdings in the company. As I say, such agreement uh, uh, to continued employment is not unheard of, but is relatively rare. And uh, uh, generally, termination of employment alone is uh, insufficient to establish unfair prejudice. Generally, these sorts of cases involve the dismissal of a shareholder from his position as a director of the company. There is generally no unfair prejudice if a minority shareholder stroke director voluntarily resigns from his position as a director of the company. In practice, whether a shareholder director has voluntarily resigned or been pushed often involve pretty fine distinctions being made. It's also worth uh, 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 highlighting uh, uh, the issue that sometimes arises in relation to a failure to reappoint. Where there's been a voluntary resignation, um, but the shareholder uh, then has a change of mind and seeks reappointment, the cases tend to suggest that the failure to reappoint does not involve unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of the company, even if a right to directorship was initially contemplated, um, uh, whether uh, by agreement or it, it, uh, as a result of an incidence, uh, 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 according to a finding of quasi-partnership. It seems to me that uh, if there exists some form of formal or informal agreement, that a participant should be entitled to uh, uh, involvement in the conduct and management of the company's affairs, then there might arguably be unfair prejudice in refusing to reappoint a shareholder as a director when that participant seeks to reassert that right. But as I say, in practice, the cases tend to um, uh, 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 find against that conclusion, holding that a failure to reappoint once a shareholder director has resigned from his position does not generally involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. <laughs>
I also want in this context, finally, to just remind you uh, of a, an issue which I raised, I think, last week, which is that uh, particularly in, a, in the exclusion from participation cases, the petitioner's own conduct can often be uh, raised as uh, relevant. It's very often suggested that the petitioner's own conduct justifies his dismissal such that uh, his dismissal from his position, say, as a director of a company should not be considered unfair. As I think I mentioned last week, and I certainly uh, want to uh, uh, emphasise this week, uh, generally, in order to justify an exclusion uh, of uh, a participant uh, from uh, uh, involvement in the conduct of the uh, affairs of the uh, company, um, that petitioner's own conduct must be pretty serious misconduct. Um, there's no doubt, for example, that misconduct, if it took the form of a misappropriation of funds from the company, would uh, certainly justify a, uh, parti uh, a petitioner's removal from his position as a uh, director. But it's fair to say that the courts are understandably reluctant to engage in a balancing assessment of uh, counter allegations of various day-to-day -day misdemeanors by the participants, which often results um, when allegations of uh, exclusion from participation are relied upon. And the riposte to that is uh, 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 to raise issues of uh, the petitioner's own uh, uh, misconduct. I now want to turn to perhaps the other uh, most common uh, example of unfairly prejudicial conduct. I call these uh, the misappropriation cases um, and cases of this sort generally it seems to me fall into uh, one of three categories. Uh, they either involve misappropriations of funds um, or they involve the misappropriation of uh, business property uh, belonging to the company or resources uh, owned by the company. And finally they involve uh, 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 the third category involves misappropriation of business opportunities that should have been exploited for the benefit of the company. Usually these sorts of misappropriation cases uh, involve breaches by directors of the duties that they owe to the company to promote its success. They often involve uh, directors also acting in circumstances which represent uh, or present conflicts of interest or uh, the making of secret profits. The first category of cases under the misappropriation head that I want to consider in a little bit more detail is the misappropriation of funds. Um, I describe these uh, in their most basic form as cases involving uh, one participant having his hand in the till. In practice, I'm sorry to report that these sorts of cases are sadly commonplace in my experience. Uh, they clearly involve unfairly prejudicial conduct, but to my mind, uh, they go beyond that. Um, these sorts of claims where uh, monies are taken out of a company uh, seem often to me to involve uh, straightforward criminal behavior. Uh, they look and smell rather like theft from the company or from the participants in the company in an indirect sense. In practice, it is uh, extremely difficult to persuade uh, the policing authorities to take an interest in such cases. Uh, they, in practice, consider these matters to be civil matters rather than criminal matters, though I, I have to say that in many cases I find it hard to see the, the distinction. These cases are not always quite so blatant or culpable uh, 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 to involve a, a hand in the till. They often involve a person making, for example, unjustified or excessive expense claims. In that regard, a, uh, a, a, a hotbed of disputes is uh, the uh, uh, area of hotel expense claims. One participant claiming that the other is incurring excessive and unjustified hotel expenses as compared to his uh, 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 more modest tastes. Sometimes uh, the controller of a company may seek to use the company's funds for his own personal benefit. He may use or, or try to use the 
the funds uh, 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 for the meeting of what are in substance uh, uh, his own personal expenses. Again, a, a, a very commonplace allegation in this regard is the use of uh, uh, the funds of the company to meet the costs of personal or family holidays dressed up to look a little bit like business trips, but in substance really involving little business purpose and substantially uh, 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 comprising a, a, a personal holiday. Another form of use of funds for personal benefit that I've already mentioned to you, uh, and I draw it again to your attention because it is again commonplace in practice, is the use of the company's funds uh, uh, to meet the costs of the respondent's defence to uh, the Section 994 proceedings. As I mentioned to you last week, um, uh, the use of such funds uh, is a clear misappropriation of funds from the company to meet what are in substance the personal legal expenses of uh, the participants themselves. Sometimes uh, the use of company funds is dressed up uh, as a loan. It's recorded as a loan uh, in the accounts of the company, a loan to the director who has taken those funds. If that loan is made otherwise than on uh, 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 commercial terms or the terms that might be expected as between parties dealing at arm's length, then such loans uh, can often uh, involve unfairly prejudicial conduct of the uh, uh, affairs of the company. Similarly, if those conducting the affairs of the company procure that the company should deal with him or with persons connected with him, on terms that are otherwise than those that might be expected between parties dealing at arm's length, then uh, uh, the procuring of the company entering into such dealings may also involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. For example, a, a director who procures that um, the company pays excessive rents for occupation of the business premises that he owns or makes excessive payment for management or administration charges is certainly likely to uh, uh, be involved in unfairly prejudicial conduct of the company's affairs. Let me look at the second category of misappropriation uh, cases. This is uh, the category that I describe as misappropriation of business property or business resource cases. Uh, uh, and these are, uh, uh, might uh, uh, be described as cases involving potentially one's hand in the stock um, again, uh, uh, it, they seem equally criminal to me if they're of that blatant nature, but again, it's difficult to engage the police interests in uh, uh, such matters. An example of uh, these sorts of cases might be where a majority shareholder or director, or shareholder and director of a company, say a building company, procures the construction of uh, a new extension to his home using the company's materials and workforce, but without properly paying for the same. These uh, misappropriation of business property cases uh, can apply not only to the trading stock and resources of the company, but also to the capital assets of uh, the company. The same principles apply whether those business properties, uh, items of business property or business resources are withdrawn for the company without uh, uh, any consideration or whether they are uh, paid for simply at an undervalue or a rate below that which might be anticipated as being payable between parties dealing at arm's length. Whenever company property or resources are transferred from the company to a person conducting the affairs of that company or a person connected with him, there is a real need in practice to be able to demonstrate that those transfers are made in return for the market value of that property or those resources. Uh, it's certainly uh, desirable to obtain independent evidence of the value of that property. Ideally, it's best to leave consideration of uh, those sorts of proposed disposals to independent directors who have no other personal interest in the proposed disposal. Let me turn to the third category of misappropriation cases that I want to consider, 
that is the misappropriation of business op opportunities. Sometimes uh, the misappropriation takes the form of an appropriation of a, a business opportunity or a commercial opportunity um, uh, 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 by a participant for his own benefit rather than that of the company concerned. Again, that sort of conduct is very likely to involve unfairly prejudicial conduct of those left out of participation of that business opportunity. The uh, misappropriation of business opportunities can take a positive form in that a director of the company may uh, engage in working competitively um, uh, for another enterprise to secure the uh, award of the contract or deal in question for the benefit of that competing enterprise rather than uh, uh, the other company with which um, uh, the ownership is shared. Alternatively, it can involve uh, a misconduct by way of omission, um, so simply failing to pursue a business opportunity available uh, uh, for the benefit of the company, resulting in it being won by another uh, enterprise with which he has connection uh, can involve misappropriation of the business opportunity. Generally, these misappropriation of business opportunity cases arise in circumstances where, as I say, the director is involved in a, uh, a competing business, or quite commonly where a director shareholder considers himself to have been the principal reason for the generation or the identification of the business opportunity itself. Greed and self-interest can often take over in those circumstances. In this context, I just want to uh, uh, reflect with you on one interesting case that I was involved in relatively recently where the outcome came as something of a surprise to me. The company concerned was uh, owned and operated by two director shareholders. They fell out and my client uh, chose to resign from his position as a director of the company. There was no unfairly prejudicial conduct in his losing his directorship as he voluntarily uh, uh, resigned. The remaining director then continued uh, uh, to uh, uh, operate the uh, board of directors alone and decided to close the business, cease trading and wind up the company. Now there was nothing wrong per se in reaching those decisions. What troubled me was that that director then started a new company uh, with which my client had no involvement at all. And all the business opportunities which then existed, potential contracts, identified uh, potential contracts, were then secured for the benefit of that new company. Uh, I argued that this involved unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of the old company. It seemed to me to involve an appropriation of those business opportunities from the old company to the new. At the very least, it seemed to me that those business opportunities should have been realised for the benefit of the old company in terms of a uh, a sale of the business and assets of the old company, including those business opportunities that had then been identified, such that the shareholders in the old company would have uh, uh, continued to participate in uh, those business opportunities. The court disagreed with me. Uh, I, I, I still cannot uh, uh, understand uh, the rationale behind that decision. Um, it seems to me that this was a clear case of the diversion of business opportunities uh, to a new company to the exclusion of uh, the petitioner. Um, uh, I, as I say, I still can't understand it. Perhaps uh, one of you may be able to explain it to me one day. Let's turn to the uh, uh, next category of um, uh, case that I want to examine by way of example of unfairly prejudicial conduct. These are the category of cases that I describe as excessive remuneration cases. These cases involve allegations of unfairly prejudicial conduct through the payment of excessive remuneration 
to shareholders who are also employed by the company, whether they're in a directorial capacity or in some other capacity. That remuneration can, of course, take the form of a salary payment or uh, 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 it can involve uh, bonus payments, um, one-off or recurring bonus payments. And very often it can include substantial contributions to personal pension arrangements held for the benefit of that participant. The unfairly prejudicial conduct of this type can also take the form not only of uh, 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 remunerative payments made to the participant or person conducting affairs of the company himself, but it can all, they can also take the form of uh, uh, remuneration made available for the benefit of persons connected with that uh, 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 other person. In other words, uh, they can include payments to spouses or other family members. There's quite clearly a tension between the payment of salaries and bonuses and pension payments made to uh, 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 those employed by a company, whether in a directorial or other capacity, and uh, the level of profits available for distribution to shareholders. Obviously, the higher salaries, bonuses or pension contributions that are paid, the less is left available for distribution to shareholders. There are essentially two types of case that deal with uh, excessive remuneration. Uh, the first is uh, remuneration being paid in excess of the rates agreed for uh, between the participants as that which should be paid to them uh, for the services that they provide to the company. So, for example, there is often agreement between the participants either that they should be paid equally or that they should be paid uh, unequally but only at agreed rates. If one shareholder controller takes more than the other or more than he is, uh, it has been agreed that they should be entitled to, then that readily involves um, uh, unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of the company. The second type of case uh, it, it, in this area are uh, those remuneration uh, cases where excessive remuneration is taken by a participant uh, uh, when compared to uh, uh, the market rate for the services uh, that would be paid if uh, the individual was dealing at arm's length with the company. Again, payment at excessive rates frequently involves unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of a company. Let me say a word about the importance of expert evidence in this uh, context. Um, expert evidence as to the market value of services provided is often very important uh, in these sorts of cases. It uh, may very readily be required to demonstrate that the rates of remuneration are not excessive. Likewise, once again, uh, I should stress the desirability of independent uh, directors uh, setting rates of remuneration uh, for the participants in a company or indeed the use of remuneration committees in making decisions over salaries, bonus payments and pension contributions. Their involvement can often be crucial in terms of the objective justification of the payments made. In this context I'll just draw your attention to a quote that I find quite helpful, which is that of Mr. Justice Blackburn in the Irvine case, where he said that uh, when looking at uh, excessive remuneration, the test is whether applying objective commercial criteria, the remuneration which the respondent took was within the bracket that executives carrying the responsibility and discharging the sort of duties that the respondent was, would expect to receive. Note from that quote, it's an objective uh, assessment, of course, and that the assessment is usually made of a bracket of uh, 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 as to the remuneration that might be considered reasonable for uh, any particular services rather than at a particular level. In practice, there are uh, a, a number 
of uh, 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 guides as to the levels of remuneration that are uh, considered reasonable within uh, 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 as between persons dealing at arm's length in various roles and in companies in various sectors. Uh, one such uh, 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 survey is published by the uh, Association of British Insurers, I think it's called the Principles of Remuneration. Uh, other uh, uh, firms of accountants publish similar reviews and guidance in this area and they're often uh, 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 of considerable importance um, when trying to persuade the courts as to what is a, a fair level of remuneration for the services provided. Before moving away from the excessive remuneration cases, I will just say this. Uh, in, in my experience, it is difficult uh, uh, to, uh, it is often difficult to challenge uh, the salary bonus or pension contribution levels uh, being paid to directors and employees as being ex excessive uh, and so involving unfairly prejudicial conduct of the company's affairs. It's often difficult to challenge them because quite naturally those setting uh, the levels of remuneration tend to t be quite careful in the steps they uh, 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 take to uh, 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 demonstrate um, or, or permit them to demonstrate the uh, 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 objective commercial justification for the level of um, uh, salary or other remuneration uh, that uh, they are provided with. Another area of uh, unfairly prejudicial conduct that one comes across pretty regularly are uh, uh, the uh, payment of wrongful or inadequate dividends. These allegations are often uh, the counterpoints to allegations of excessive payments by way of remuneration for services. It's often alleged that as a result of an excessive payment of salary, for example, or bonus payments, there have been inadequate dividends uh, or insufficient dividends uh, paid to uh, the shareholders, uh, uh, to the other shareholders. Again, the uh, these sorts of cases can take a number of different forms. So, for example, they can take uh, the simple form of a failure to pay a sufficient dividend. They can take the form of case where there is a failure to give proper consideration to the payment of dividends. Um, they can take the form of a failure to implement a prior agreement as to the dividend policy to be adopted and implemented by uh, the company and they can also take the case uh, take the form of a case um, whereby uh, uh, there is a failure to pay dividends proportionately between the holders of uh, 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 a particular category or the category of uh, shares in the company. I will just simply mention the fact that it is pretty clear from the authorities now that the directors as part of their duties do owe a duty to shareholders to give proper consideration to the payment of dividends so that if they fail in that duty in some respect that generally will involve unfairly prejudicial conduct of the company's affairs. Let me just mention in passing uh, 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 some other issues relating to shares that represent unfairly prejudicial conduct in practice. Um, using new issues of shares, for example, for an ulterior purpose rather than simply to raise required share capital for the benefit of the company uh, may involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. So if uh, a controller uh, uh, seeks to make an issue of shares in order to obtain greater control for himself, that may uh, involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. Likewise, a failure to adhere to preemption rights in respect of new issues of shares where those preemption rights are uh, provided uh, in law or under the terms of the articles or any shareholders agreement may well uh, result in, uh, may, may well uh, involve unfairly prejudicial conduct such denial of preemption rights often result in shifts of power or control within a company and that is uh, 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 something that the courts 
um, have frowned upon when uh, that uh, 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 when a denial of those rights is um, uh, attempted. Likewise, a failure to adhere to uh, restrictions on the transfer of shares imposed by the Articles of Association of a company or in a shareholders agreement may well involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. And similarly, the reclassification of shares, for example, varying entitlements to vote or entitlements to participate in dividends uh, may involve unfairly prejudicial conduct of the affairs of the company. The penultimate category that I want to uh, uh, consider is the cases that involve what I describe as procedural irregularity. Unfair prejudice may arise um, where those conducting the affairs of the company do so uh, otherwise than in accordance with the procedures set uh, 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 by the company's constitutional documents. So, for example, if the, uh, uh, a, a controlling participant fails to observe the procedural rules set out in the Memorandum and Articles of Association, or fails to comply with uh, the requirements set out in a shareholders agreement, then those failures in procedure, uh, a, a specified procedure, may well involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. It's worth emphasising, however, that whether a procedural irregularity will uh, justify any particular type of relief um, depends crucially on the seriousness of the irregularity, uh, uh, and that rather depends on the consequences of that irregularity. Sometimes the irregularity is of such serious nature that it will uh, justify a purchase order being made, other times it may simply uh, be corrected by the making of a uh, mandatory or prohibitory form of injunctive relief. These sorts of procedural irregularities include failures to call meetings of directors or shareholders, a failure to lay uh, accounts or information before directors and shareholders, and a failure to give notice uh, of meetings of uh, 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 directors or shareholders uh, as required. The final category that I want to draw your attention to are those cases that involve a failure to conduct the business of the company in accordance with a pre-agreed policy or plan. Uh, these cases are uh, uh, common and uh, somewhat complex um, in practice. Uh, I think it's sufficient for the purposes of these, this introductory series of seminars to simply say that a failure um, by the participants to act in accordance with an agreed business plan, for example, or a failure to implement resolutions of the board of directors or indeed of shareholders may well uh, involve a breach of the agreement between the participants that founded the basis of their participation in the company and so may involve unfairly prejudicial conduct. I think that is a convenient place to bring this uh, lecture to an end. I thank you once again for all joining me. I hope that you found uh, this uh, lecture, a, uh, 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 the subject matter of this uh, lecture interesting. Um, I. Uh, think perhaps that the next lecture, which is next Monday, and uh, it's a lecture where I'm going to be concentrating on the remedies that the courts give for uh, unfairly prejudicial conduct, and the question of uh, 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 the ability to make application to strike out a petition on the basis that it represents an abuse of the process of the court in the face of a uh, a sufficiently fair offer to purchase the petitioner's share, shares is likely to be the last in this series of seminars. Um, I will address uh, the questions that have been sent to me by email. If you've got any uh, further questions, then please uh, let me have them in the meantime. Um, uh, until next week, I wish you all well and uh, I look forward to uh, speaking with you, uh, as I say, this same time uh, next week. Many thanks indeed. Bye bye.